I'm going to show you how to fix the hair. I'm the hair master. And, and I know you're the hair master. Oh, yes. Okay. So I know that everybody does hair wrong. And I know yes. you've got thousands of people that you've taught. So we're excited about this. Let's get this show started. I am so excited to be with you guys today. And I coach people who like to create narrative portraits. They're kind of telling their own family's story in the portrait art. And I'm classically trained, but apprentices really don't want to take decades to learn how to draw portraits. So I simplified the old master's method into a four-step system that can take you from stick figures to realistic portraits. But when you first start, <laughs> a lot of people make a lot of mistakes. So what I'm going to do first is walk you through some of the common mistakes. And then in my demo today, I'm going to show you the solution to those frequent problems. So here's the first example. This 70 year old lady was struggling with three common mistakes. You can see on the left side, her proportions were off because when you're full, because the anatomical proportions are going to be different from those of adults. And secondly, she was only just using one pencil. So you can see she really didn't get a good range of values. Lights and darks were not showing up in her portrait. And then the third mistake she was making, she didn't know how to render the textures, the delicate texture of a baby fine hair or that texture on the denim. So the drawing on the right was done just a few weeks after she learned how to use some of the steps that I'm gonna show you today. If you're watching today, you might be a little bit scared of drawing portraits. Maybe you've never even drawn one before. And so this example is really going to encourage you. This mathematician graduated from Stanford, so she's super bright, but she never had a course in art. But when she retired, she wanted to cultivate her right brain by drawing her family portraits. But when she got stick figures, she got super discouraged. You can see on the left, she was struggling with proportions. And on the left, the drawing has no depth, and she didn't know how to shade the right textures. So when I showed her my simple system for accuracy, her proportions improved dramatically, as you can see in the portrait on the left, but she was still struggling with depth. So I helped her understand how to use a wider range of values by using a bunch of different pencils, different densities. And so you can see that the baby on the right had light hair and it was fading into the background. But when she used the pencils to darken the background on the right side, you can see that all of a sudden the baby and the grandma were popping off the paper. This is called the principle of contrast and I'm gonna show you that today. So we've touched on a few of the common portrait mistakes but the number one nemesis of everybody is drawing accurate hair textures. So in my realism live demo, I did a whole workshop on hair, every kind of hair you can think of. But today I'm gonna to take a mistake that somebody made that was doing it wrong, and I'm gonna show you how to correct that. That's always super valuable to people to know exactly when it's wrong, how do I fix it? So I have here an example of somebody who did some hair, and this was done by one of my apprentices. And can you see that okay, Eric? Yeah, we can see it, Sandra. It's it's a little far away, but we'll work with it. Okay, I can get it a little closer. How's that? Yeah, the closer you can get it, the better. Okay, good. So you can see that she was doing the hair, but there was a lack of range of values. We just talked about that. She did it three different times, so I have three examples. And there's really no depth in this hair at all. If you look at the face and the hair, you can see there's a wide range of values. There's highlights showing on the hair and the highlights and shadows are gonna indicate what's going on underneath. So you can't move those. You've gotta have those in the right place. And she really didn't get that wide range of values. So the first thing that I did was I corrected that by showing her how to create a map. Now, this is probably one of the most important ingredients when you're drawing hair because hair is a little bit on the nebulous side. You're never really sure, you know, where to put everything because it's not like with the nose where, you know, there's a nostril here and that's the ball of the nose, but this is all things you have no language for. So the best thing you can do is I went in and made a line drawing in this hair. 
so I could see where to put all these different clumps because the hair falls in clumps based on what's going on underneath the, uh, that hair. And then the next thing that I did was <clears throat> I blew it up and made it bigger. When you're drawing, <clears throat> excuse me, super small like this, it's almost like you have to take a toothpick and draw. So I went and blew it up. I don't know if you can see that, but I blew it up really big like that so that it would be easier to draw. Even if in your drawing, you're gonna be doing something that's small, I recommend you practice it large because then you can kind of get the hang of the way things are. And then when you go smaller, you know what to do. And so what I did today was I actually went ahead and did one side of this. You can see how it improves it when I add the values and so forth. And then now I'm actually going to work on some segments of hair. So did now, you just, you took a photocopy of her drawing and then started working on top of it? Actually, this is one of her originals. She sent me three originals. And this is one of the reasons that I corrected her because we were doing an online apprenticeship and I was telling her what to do, but she did it wrong three times. So I said, send me the drawing and I will correct it on camera for you. Okay. And that way I can show her how to do that. This one that I enlarged, that is a photocopy. So it'd be tough to work on that because I couldn't erase the highlights if I needed to. So I decided to go ahead and work on this small one so I can erase things if I need to. All right. Okay. So now I'm just going to grab a quick drink of water here. So can you tell us about the, do, what kind of pencils are you using? Oh, yeah, and, sure. And maybe the, you said there's a range of pencils we need to use. Yes. I already have some put on my table. But this is my Derwent set. It's from the UK and they have really good graphite over there. So I like to use this because you can get a really good range of values. It's almost like you're coloring. It's almost like you have a paint palette here, but it's all in graphite. It's in black and white. And it's real important to use all these different colors, not to take your hard lead and try to make it dark. When you're ready to do something dark, just grab a dark pencil. And so, so what's wrong with taking a hard lead and trying to make it dark? You're just going to crush the tooth of the paper and you're not going to get it as dark as it is in real life. Right. You're going to get it maybe uh, on a scale of one to 10 for the values. You might be able to go as dark as a two, but you could never get it to 10 with that hard lead. Okay. And the harder you try, the more you crush the tooth of the paper and then it won't accept more graphite. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. And then I do, I use this to keep the crumbs off the paper. This is my goat hairbrush. And then I also use a battery eraser and I use a kneaded eraser. I use the kneaded eraser when I want a soft line and I use the battery eraser when I want a hard line. So you'll, you'll see me doing that today. Okay. I'm going to put these off to the side and grab my pencils again. Now, what I did was I laid out the ones that I'm going to use in order so I could see where I, you know, I've turned it up so you can see the writing on it so you can see which one you're picking up. And I always like to start with my lightest pencil. So this is my F pencil. And I start with that because if I put in all the lights first, I can get a definition of where all the values are. And if I get the values in, then I can come back and punch up those light values with a dark pencil. But if I try to put the dark in and I get it too dark, it can be tough to erase it because the problem with erasing is sometimes you kind of tear the texture of the paper. And so you want to always start with your light and work towards dark. So I'm doing this with my F pencil right now. Now you'll notice that these lines are pretty distinct and normally I wouldn't do that. In real life, I would just do a contour line drawing of this and then I would begin to put in the values and the shapes and then I would put the texture on top. But because this is a correction, I'm going with what's here. And I made these lines dark so you could see them. Now, most of the lines will be swallowed when I shade. They'll just disappear. But if they aren't, I'll just come back with my kneaded eraser and go ahead and lift that line with my kneaded eraser. So what I'm beginning to do right now is I'm putting in the values. And I'm basically trying to determine what is dark and what is light. And on a scale of one to 10, is this a one? Is this a you know, number three value? Is this a number 10 value? And I wanna get my values right because that's what gives you a wide range of lights and darks. 
and then that's what makes it pop off the paper. So if you're new to values or you don't understand that concept, if you can imagine white being the lowest mm -hmm. value and black mm -hmm. being the darkest mm -hmm. value. Uh, so if she says a 10, then that would be black. If she says a zero or a one, that would be white. Thank you. That's a really good explanation. Absolutely. And you want to save the paper to be your white value, your lightest value. Your number one value is the paper. So you don't want to go too dark with that. Now I switch to my three because down in here, I'm actually getting a much darker shadow. And it's so important to draw your hair in clumps rather than putting them all in as, you know, just strands because they, they fall based on your anatomy. If you move your head, your hair is going to shift along with the head. Now, normally when I draw something like this, I'm a realist. I'm a persnickety. I mean, if I was drawing, you know, a goose, I would put in every single dimple. If it's been a plucked chicken, every single dimple would go in there. So I normally draw quiet. I don't say anything while I'm drawing because then that allows me to be a little bit more accurate. When I'm demonstrating on camera, I um, am never going to get my best accuracy, but it doesn't matter because I'm giving you the general essence of it. So I'm looking at that and you can see that I actually got that a little bit darker than it is. So that's super easy to correct. I'm going to hold, can you just hold it up to the camera a little bit so we can get a yeah. little closer view of it? Is that good? Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. All right. Okay. Let me push the camera down a little bit more. Is that better? Much, much better. Okay, cool. All right. That's just about two or three inches from my screen. So I'm going to see. I know it's my... tight. <laughs> <laughs> Probably can't today. see it. Yeah, it's okay. We're good. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this kneaded eraser and I'm just going to tap on that to lift up that value because it got a little bit on the dark side. When I'm lifting values and I want them to be soft, I use a kneaded eraser. If I want a, a distinct line, then I would use my battery eraser. So let me see if I can do this without moving the camera. See how I put a hair in there? And you want to make sure that you run off the eraser in between. See how it gets a little bit black in between there? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a spare piece of paper that I have handy and I'm just going to run that eraser off. There we go. And that's, now it gets rid of that graphite. That's so you're not spreading the dark. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is with the battery eraser, a lot of times you can't really control the line all that well. It may not get exactly where you want it to be. So what I will do is I'll just come back with my pencil and just adjust it. It's no big deal. It's not like, you know, you you can't make a mistake. You can. You just come back and make that the, the line that you want it to be. And you can see we're already starting to get value and dimension. But what we don't want is for this to look like a coloring book, like stained glass or something. So in order to swallow that line, what I would do is just go ahead and put a dark behind it. And right now I've got my F pencil. The F pencil may not be dark enough to swallow that line up. I'm just going to shade on the forehead here and we'll see how that goes. If it isn't, I come in with a darker, but I start with my lightest value first because I want to make sure that I don't go too dark. It's harder to lift my dark values than it is to put a darker value down. Now I grab my three pencil. And you can see I'm getting a little bit darker. And this should swallow up that line. You can tell I live near a fire station. Can you hear that? <laughs> oh, I thought they were coming for you. <laughs> coming to take me away. Ha <laughs> ha. That, that funny song it was popular when we were kids. Yeah. So there I, that um, shadow behind it kind of swallowed that up. So that's cool. All right. Now I want to make sure that I move from clump to clump in order. It's like assembling a jigsaw puzzle. So I don't want to skip around. It's just like you put the edge pieces in 
And then after you get the edge pieces, you put the piece next to that and so forth. And I can see that line's a little on the dark side, so I'm gonna just lift it up with my battery eraser. Why? Because this one I wanna get rid of. If I wanna get rid of a line, then I use the battery eraser. Okay. Makes your life so much easier with these great tools. Oh my goodness. Before I found that eraser, it was so hard because you had to leave all the lights light, you know, and you couldn't just take it back out again if you needed to. So it'll erase just about anything except for cellulite and wrinkles on your face. I've tried that on my personal face, that is. <laughs> But one of the things I love about it, too, is that it will lift colored pencil. Colored pencil is made out of wax. So when you are using a pencil, if you use an eraser on wax, it, it creates this horrible slurry. But the battery eraser won't do that. It just lifts it right off. So it's really cool. It's a great tool. Now I'm going to reach for my four because I'm really not getting dark enough with these other colors. So I'm going to punch in a shadow right in here. And you want to keep your pencils pretty sharp. It's harder to keep the soft lead sharp because they get dull really fast. What do you use to sharpen your pencils? I use an electric sharpener. It's I, I like a vertical one because then I'm in the same venue that I am with my drawing. My drawing pencil is vertical and I just reach over to the sharpener and put it down in the sharpener. I don't like the um, horizontal sharpeners because you have to sort of chase it across the table. So I like the vertical sharpener. And I have one that has different size holes in it. So that's kind of nice because different pencil companies will often make different diameters in their pencil. Yep. Derwent does that with their colored pencils. You can see how this is already starting to take on depth and dimension. Makes a big difference. It really does. And what happens is now I feel like there's somebody underneath this hair instead of feeling like it's a wig. And this is one of the most common mistakes. What I just showed you first is number one mistake, drawing too small. I'm sticking with it because that's what her original is. But you would probably want to practice at least eight by 10 or five by seven on most of your stuff. And then number two, she didn't do a very good map. I need a map to show me where all the clumps are. And I do the map ahead of time because when I'm shading, I don't want to have to think about proportions. And I don't want to have to think about the anatomical shift. So if I get a really good line drawing, then I know exactly where to put every clump. So and a line next... drawing is what you would refer to as a map. Getting, getting the drawing right from the beginning. Mm-hmm. All Some right. people refer to it as a contour line drawing. and But for me, it's just a matter of mapping in where I'm going to be shading because it's a lot easier to map it ahead of time than it is to try to map it while you shade. And then the next thing you want to do is what I'm doing right now, which is I am putting in values. So I'm coming in here and saying, okay, is that a number four value? Is that a number six value? Is that number one? What value is this? Because that range of values is what's going to give you dimension and depth in your work. And after I finish putting the values in, then I'll come in and put in the textures. Now, so you're not doing, you're, even though you're doing clumps, you're not completing clumps. So you're putting values in first and then adding texture later. Right. And you don't have to do it that way. When I'm more advanced, I don't always do it that way. But for a beginner, it's a really good four-step process. Thinking line, then thinking value, then thinking shape, then thinking texture. And if you are a beginner, sometimes it's hard to think of all four of those at once. So if you just do it in steps, you put in the lines, then you put in the shapes, then you put in the shadows, then you put in the texture, it's a little bit less to be concerned with. All right. Okay, now I'm gonna do something that's really common and that is that when you look at this hair, it has um, a white edge. So that's a problem because if I have white against white paper, we're gonna have a problem separating those. 
So the way to do that, and I'm going to show you how to do that, is to go ahead and just shade a little bit of background in there. And you don't want to put like a halo, you know, like, oh, there's a light value. So now there's this black halo behind it. You don't want that. You'd come back in later and put in, you know, some interesting negative shapes in the background. But I'm just going to shade that a little bit to show you how to make the white pop out. So first of all, she has this area dark. So I've got to take it down and make it lighter. And I'm going to use a battery eraser because I want to go back to number one value. And again, don't worry if you don't get it exact because you can easily correct that. I'm two inches from the screen, so sorry if this camera keeps moving when I'm trying to tuck my pencils under here. Here we go. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is rather than um, shade the hair, I'm going to shade the background. So I'm just going to come in here with my F pencil. Remember, we start with the light and then go darker if we need to. I'm also going to formulate the, the root. You always want to have darks at the roots, even if you just paid a lot of money to get rid of those <laughs> dark roots. <laughs> Because if you don't do that, it'll look like a wig. It's not yeah. anchored to your head. Yeah, my hair is completely natural. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't want to be one of those guys where they go, "Oh, he dyes his hair." Yeah. For some reason that yeah. happens with guys. It never happens with women. I know you're allowed to. Women are supposed to keep dyeing their hair, but I like I like silver hair. It's really fun to draw silver hair, kind of like drawing blondes, very similar. So you can see I'm starting with this shading behind that white and I'm kind of blending that out. Later on, I could come in and create a background, you know, for this, but that helps to pop that out. And I want to take my, you know, frequently take your dust brush and brush those crumbs off because if you don't you can accidentally press on it and then it gets embedded in the paper it's really tough to get it out i I've think you should just have just put a fan next to your paper and it just keeps blowing it off yeah except it blows the paper <laughs> <laughs> that's why they but make you tape could tape it down yeah yeah drafting tape you could use that so now over here, I'm seeing that this light area goes down, but it's not quite as light as the other one. And I'm going to move this so I don't accidentally draw on top of it. You want to make sure when you're drawing that you're always drawing on a comfortable surface. You can see I've got this board underneath. It's called Barco board, and it really absorbs. It's kind of like the olden days when they used to use those pads for writing desks. Yeah. Yeah, it works really well. So you can see now I'm I'm starting my F pencil. You try to take you, you try to take your pencil in the direction that you would see the brush strokes. Really good point. Exactly. You want to go and always build, even if you're shading with gradation. Gradation is where you don't lift your pencil off the paper at all. You still go in the direction of the object because it really sculpts it even when you can't see the strokes it does sculpt it you don't don't want to shade willy-nilly i'm going to take out a little bit of light right here i don't want it to be distinct i just want to highlight right there because it's hitting the head and if i take this highlight all the way across it's going to look like there's a highlight there in the head that's going to sculpt that anatomy and you can see that I got it a little dark and it's no big deal. You just come in and fix it, you know. And I did that with the kneaded eraser because I didn't want it to be distinct. So now I'm going to go to this part right in here. And hair has a tendency to um, blow in the wind. I mean, even unless you're one of those women who has your hair lacquered and you have a bubble or a beehive like they did in the olden days, your hair is always going to be escaping the edges. So we want to create a casual line right here where this is just kind of spilling out. You can see that her hair was kind of blowing a little wispy. So I'm going to do that, but I need to lighten up this shading that I did. 
this is a little bit too dark. It's going to look like a coloring book if I don't take this needed eraser and soften that line up. I wanted it to be big, to be dark enough that you guys could see it, but now it wouldn't serve my purpose to have it that dark. In fact, I'll give you a little tip. Um, if you do your line drawing fairly dark, before you get started, you can just take your kneaded eraser and go across the entire line drawing and just lift that up, just gently lift like that, and it'll get it to be exactly the text, uh, the value that you want it to be. Okay, I'm back to my F now, and I can see there's a piece that goes over here. Oh, well, let me show you. Before I do this, I want to show you something really quick. So when I'm doing my... Um, drawing, I do not want to use a, a gradated stroke anymore because I'm past the textures, I'm past the shading. So now I'm going to put texture. Well, I'm going to exaggerate this. This needs to be anchored to the head and this is the wispy edge. So you want that wispy edge and you want to lift up at the end of the stroke and lift up this way. So your strokes are going in both directions. What you don't want to happen is you don't want to have all the strokes start in the same place. And then this right here gives you this rainbow look. This is bad. Okay. So what you want to do is you want your hair to go in both directions and you're lifting at the end of your stroke. This is called a hatching line. And I'm putting this in now because I'm going to, I'm ready to put in the textures. Okay, so I'm going to switch back to my drawing again. All right. Now I'm going to use this F pencil. You want your pencil super, super sharp when you are doing hatching. So I'm putting these edges out here, both directions. You're going to really like the demo during Realism Live because I'm going to show you how to do wavy hair and curly hair and straight hair and all different kinds of textures. But awesome. I find, that, yeah, I find that a lot of people really benefit from seeing corrections because everybody makes the same mistakes. So this is a good chance to show you what you might be doing wrong and how to fix it. Well, I think pointing out that it's clumpy uh, and, and showing a demo like this really makes it come true, you know, and because you said your person tried it two or three times, but this is really, really making the yeah. point. Yes. And a lot of times, I mean, I teach online a lot. My, my people are in 49 countries, so we definitely go online for teaching, but sometimes they, they don't get it if you just tell them, but if you show them, then that's a whole nother thing. And so showing her how to fix this is a really, really big help. And everybody makes the same mistakes. So everybody benefits from watching this because you're probably doing this yourself. There's a little bit of a division right here. And just so you know, while I'm on camera is never going to be my most accurate because when you're talking, it's really hard to stay focused on, you know, what's really there because you're kind of thinking about the audience and things like that. Oh, I know. People I don't realize how difficult yeah. that is. And, and in this environment, you know, it's one thing, but when you're in our studio and you've got all these people with cameras and big lenses and big lights and bright brightness, yeah. it changes everything. So, yeah, you have to be really good at ignoring all that. Yep. Now I'm going to come in and put in some um, light values right here with my eraser. And then go, you always want it when you're putting in a light value, you always want to put the dark under it first. So that way it'll show up when you're putting that in. And I recommend at home when you do draw, don't, don't correct a lot while you're drawing, just Keep drawing and then 
you can come back and fix things. I usually will do the, the, you know, maybe work on it for half an hour, 45 minutes. And then I go get a lemonade or iced tea and I come back and I, a lot of times my left brain has been like a pop-up menu telling me how bad I'm doing. That's the left brain does that. Um, and I come back and there's nothing wrong with it, you know, because you lose your ability to be objective while you're drawing. So don't listen to that left brain. Well, the other thing, it's good to get away because when you step away, you have, uh, you have a little bit of, of uh, perspective, a different change of perspective. All right. I just wanted to show this, Eric, because you may think, well, I don't really want to be a drawing artist, but the reality is once you learn to draw, then you can apply it to any medium. This is just a colored pencil piece that I'm working on, but you can see I'm using the exact same kind of strokes that I would use with the pencil and graphite. And it's gonna translate similar into watercolor, pastels, oils, acrylics, and so forth. These concepts of using line map, shape map, value map, and then putting the texture on top, it's the same with every medium. So mastering it at the drawing level is a really good way to prepare yourself for any medium that you're gonna use. And, and, and so I should, really I should excited. mention, I should just mention that mastering drawing is essential and, and your lessons are so great. We're going to put in the comments, uh, where to get your lessons or where to get your mentoring program, uh, because it's so valuable, uh, to be able to master drawing. If you get your drawing down, everything else will come into place. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I've got a workshop coming up after this too, um, where I'm going to spend three days on portraits. But first of all, you need to go to Realism Live and watch that incredible hair texture demo because there's so many different kinds of hair. And that really is the number one thing that holds people up is they want to draw faces, but they get all those, uh, the eyes and the nose and the mouth, right? And then they go, oh no, the hair, <laughs> you know, what do I do now? Yep. So it's a really important thing to master. All right. Well, uh, Sandra, I want to thank you uh, for, for being on today. We uh, let's just do a quick little wrap up and then come back on camera and then we're going to head out. Okay. okay. All right. Oh, she's upside down. She's there. <laughs> Am I upside down? No, no, you're perfect. You were upside down <laughs> for a second. Uh, well, so Sandra, funny. thank you for being on today and for demonstrating this idea and yeah. the, the idea of the, the tools and the clumping and the, and the halo shading and the, all the different pieces of it. I, it was really helpful. And there are things that I had never considered as someone who draws uh, and draws badly. So I guess I need to attend one of your courses or your mentoring program, but great job today. We're looking forward to having you on Realism Live. And I, uh, I, I just very thankful for you. Thank you so much. You really truly are an angel. Oh, thank you, Eric. It's been so much fun to be with you today. And I hope everybody comes to Realism Live. There's like nothing like it in the whole world. You know, you'd have to travel miles and miles and miles to study with this many different masters. So it's a really cool event. I'm excited well, about it. Thank you for saying that. I, I, th I think quite frankly, you know, even if you were, uh, you know, a, a very wealthy person, I'm not so sure that these people that we have would even do lessons with you because some of them just yes. don't do it anymore. Uh, I can think of two, there are probably more, but there are two of them who don't do any teaching under any circumstances for any amount of money. And, uh, uh, one of them, we had to really, really talk into doing it because he would not, he just wouldn't do it and uh, hasn't done it yeah. for a long time and is, you know, is very prominent. So I think that this is very rare and a, and a really great opportunity. And we're very honored to have you coming to Realism Live and teaching more ways to draw hair. Yeah.